I work at a large crafting store in California and have been there for about a year and eight months now. So last year, we hired this guy. Let's call him Hayden. Hayden was a little quiet on the first day, but quickly became more talkative and over the next couple of weeks, he just wouldn't shut up. He would constantly say weird things. For instance, one day he was put in charge of building furniture. He was apparently having difficulty assembling the table that he was working on and said something about cutting his wrist if he can't figure out how to put it together. There was another time where we were both working in the stock room and he kept talking about how much he looked like the Parkland shooter, Nicholas Cruz, which was really creepy. I mean, why would you even say something like that? I remember one day where I had just gotten off work and I was waiting for my ride to pick me up when out of nowhere, Hayden walked up behind me. He kind of just stood there with an awkward smile on his face, and I politely asked him, Uh, what's up? He said something along the lines of, Oh, you know, nothing much. Just enjoying my lunch break. I'm thinking about going inside Taco Bell and shanking someone. He pretty much laughed and just said he was joking after saying that. When my wife picked me up, we saw him walking towards the Taco Bell and then he just gave us this super weird smile. So the last straw for me was when he and I were assigned to work our spring freight and get it loaded up on a large U-boat. Our shift started at 7am and it was over at noon. It was 11 and we still hadn't finished our task because Hayden just wouldn't stop goofing around. He would also work very slowly on purpose and would only take one item to the U-boat at once. Our boss came to where we were working and was pretty upset that we weren't done yet. He told us we would both get written up if the job wasn't finished before we got off. Now, I was pissed off at this point and Hayden knew it. He seemed to feel bad for pretty much getting me in trouble, but he apologized. He then said something that really concerned me. He said in the most serious tone that I had ever heard him speak in since meeting him. If I ever get fired, I'm definitely going to shoot this place up. He went on to say that he knew where all the emergency exits are, and would first shoot all of the cashiers, and then move on to the other employees in the store. I'll admit that I didn't immediately report what he said, but it did have me on edge, and I just kept thinking about what if. After some convincing from my wife, I finally did the right thing and I informed my manager. They took a written report from me and contacted the police. After about two more days of working with Hayden, he was fired and subsequently arrested for his threats. The week after he got arrested, my boss held a meeting with the entire staff and told everyone what happened. After everyone had left the meeting, he pulled me aside and revealed to me what the police and Hayden talked about during the interrogation. I don't completely remember what was said, but Hayden apparently admitted that he said what he said and kept asking if I had been the one who reported him. Fast forward to a few weeks ago. I was working at the same store and I was heading to the break room for my final break when I then heard a voice from one of the aisles to the left. There was a man standing next to the paint case and he asked if I could get him some paint. While I was opening the case, he then addressed me by my name, which I immediately thought was pretty weird because I wasn't wearing my name tag on this particular day. Out of curiosity, I decided to ask him how he knew my name. And well, he said it was just a lucky guess, to which I knew was total BS. Mainly because his tone of voice seemed sarcastic. The entire time I was getting his paint, he was just staring at me with a smirk on his face. He then began to ask me questions about my name, which also happens to be the same name of a popular TV show character. He asked me what year I was born, why my parents decided to give me that name, etc. At this point, I started to walk away as I had other things that I really needed to do, and the whole time that I was walking away, he was still just trying to talk to me. I actually heard him yelling my name from three aisles down. I went and stood in the warehouse until I thought he was gone. Later that same day, one of my coworkers asked me if I knew the guy who was buying the paint, which I told her I didn't. She told me that he had approached her and asked her all kinds of weird questions about me, 
like if I'm a good worker and she likes me as a co-worker. This is an ongoing issue too, as he's come in the store two other times. One being yesterday during my day off, and apparently he asked where I was. I don't really know for sure, but I suspect this guy might be cousins with Hayden, as they kind of look alike and have similar mannerisms. Both similar to the Parkland shooter, and both have that same creepy vibe. This might not be the scariest story out there, but it was still pretty dang creepy for me. For some context, I live in a house on a cul-de-sac with my mom, two brothers, and a roommate. I work two part-time jobs, one of which is in the same office my mom works at. I'm 20, my brothers are 17, my mom is 57, and the roommate is 18. We also live very close to a volunteer firehouse that blares an extremely loud alarm whenever there's an emergency. Everyone within a couple of miles can always hear the alarm. I would say we're in the middle class and live in a modest house but has a large front yard because our driveway is super long. About seven years ago we moved into our house and for a while everything was chill. That is until we found out about our crazy neighbor who I will call Bob for privacy reasons. Now Bob has extremely paranoid schizophrenia and legitimately believes that the government is after him. He thinks that people are trying to brainwash him via microwaves, and he freaks out whenever he hears a plane pass by, because in his mind he thinks they're after him. Whenever the firehouse blares the alarm, Bob calls the police because he thinks someone is coming after him, and literally every time they always tell him he can't do that. He has also made some pretty odd comments about one of my brothers as well. For a few years, we didn't really hear from him much. That is, until one day when he sent a letter in the mail trying to sell us his baseball cards for a million dollars. Apparently he sent the same exact letter to everyone else in the cul-de-sac. Everyone obviously discarded the letters. All of our neighbors are aware of Bob. They thought he was just a little crazy, but mainly harmless. We thought so too. We were wrong. Last winter, we began to find mysterious footprints in the snow. It was a human's footprints across the front yard of the house. We knew it wasn't any of our footprints because none of us walked so far out into that part of our front yard like that. We kind of just shrugged it off as something odd. For a while, Bob hadn't really bothered us and we weren't really thinking much of him at the time. Flash forward to a few days ago. The police were at Bob's house. Apparently, Bob's being evicted. We all kind of just breathed a sigh of relief because, well, he was pretty weird. But we didn't really think much of it. The next day after that was a pretty normal day. Nothing odd. That was until Bob showed up at work. He began to rant to everyone about how he's in the military before going to my mom's secretary asking to have lab work on him done. Now, this was raising a bunch of red flags because my mom never told him where she worked. Not only that, but to find my mom's secretary, you'd have to go back behind the main row of secretaries into a smaller area where there's a large printer. My mom's secretary is in the smaller area, and it should be impossible for a stranger who hasn't been there before to know where she was. How the hell did Bob know where to find my mom's secretary and ask for my mom, despite not ever being there before, and also my mom never telling him her name? Well, this totally freaked us all out and we decided to do some more research on Bob. It turns out that his dad was ex-military and that Bob actually owns a bunch of firearms. Bob's shady behavior towards my mom and showing up at our work could only mean one thing. This man is stalking us and he's dangerous. At the very least, we've begun to suspect that he's been going through our mail. It was also very likely that it was his footprints that were in the snow of our front yard last winter. My mom got a peace order rather quickly and then notified all of the other neighbors about what happened. We thought and hoped that maybe things would die down now, but no. Just today he was in the parking lot of work, staring blankly at one of the secretaries. She said that Bob was sweating and looked a little off. 
he didn't stop staring at her. He asked about my mom yet again. Everyone in the family is on edge. He has guns. He's been stalking my mom at work and is being evicted. He doesn't really have much to lose if he did some dangerous crap to us. We notified the police and we're making sure to lock all of the doors and also install security cameras so that we can see if he comes onto our property again. No one is allowed home alone until the craziness stops and until we know for a fact that we're all safe. I'll definitely update this post if anything else happens. Update. My brothers, my roommate, and I went to a dinner with my dad and his girlfriend. My mom stayed home. Apparently, while my mom was home alone, she heard some strange noises and our dogs were going crazy. Might not be anything, but still, pretty creepy with everything that's happened. Be careful. I was always the weird kid growing up. So, making friends was never really easy for me. I was a bit of a punk in high school, so living in a preppy religious town was my idea of hell. Eventually, I met this boy named Sean. I was so happy to finally have someone that I connected with. We quickly became best friends and we hung out nearly every day. He was kind of odd, but so was I, so I just looked past it. Most of the time when we were hanging out, we would also get high. So I figured some of the stuff he said was just that talking. But one day, he then said, I think I'm going to hurt someone this week. About four days later, he threatened to shoot up our school on Instagram. He played it off as a joke when I confronted him about it. But when the school confronted him, they took it much more seriously. He was taken into custody by the police, but somehow not charged with anything. His parents took away his phone and they forced him to move away for a few weeks to let the air clear, but we kept in contact. At this point, stupid me then realized I was in love with him. I did everything that I could to clear his name. I even got into some arguments with some parents on Facebook. My parents begged me to stop talking to him, but for some reason, I truly believed that he was a good person. I didn't want to believe that he was capable of hurting anyone. The whole shooting thing never really blew over. When he came back to school, all of the students would always run from him in the hallways. People were sending him threats. His entire reputation was totally ruined. After all of this happened, something in him changed. He was angrier. We would be talking and joking around about something, and then he would start attacking me with words. I'd tell him about a boy that I was talking to, and he'd call me a hoe, or if I made a new friend, he'd go out of his way to ruin my new friendship. And for some stupid reason, I just saw this as him being protective. About a year went by after this. The verbal abuse continued, and I continued to do nothing about it. I was still in love with him, but I didn't act on it since he was my closest friend. To keep my mind off Sean, I started dating a boy named Alex. Sean hated Alex. Not for any particular reason, he just didn't like that I was spending time with someone else that wasn't him. Alex was also a dealer, and Sean knew this. Sean asked if Alex would front him some green since he knew we were best friends, and Alex did. Enough to be mad about if you don't get paid for it. Well, Sean never paid Alex. Alex tried to talk to him about it, but Sean always put him off and avoided him. After about a month of this, Alex saw Sean's car in a Taco Bell parking lot and pulled up. He saw Sean in his car and he began to get out. Since Alex had anger issues, he also pulled out his baseball bat. Sean saw him and freaked out. He pulled out of his parking spot quickly and then drove off and called 911, calling it a deal gone wrong. Alex was then arrested for assault with a weapon. Three days later, when Alex got out of jail, he was driving to his friend's house when he saw Sean standing in his front yard. Alex rolled down his window and he called him a wimp, then drove away. Sean called the police again and Alex was arrested for stalking. Around this time, my parents caught me smoking. I didn't want to lie anymore, so I was totally honest and I told my parents everything. 
Obviously, they were mad at me for getting myself into this situation, and I had just told them that I was smoking and dating a dealer, so I was in a decent amount of trouble. My parents took away my phone as soon as I got home from school. I wasn't allowed to see Alex when he got out of jail, and they made me download a tracker on my phone so that they could make sure I was home when they weren't. They contemplated calling Sean's parents and telling them that we had been smoking together. But I knew that if Sean got caught smoking again, he would definitely get kicked out of his house. So I snuck my phone and I texted him that my parents might call his parents. And well, he was pissed. He called me horrible names and said that he wished he never met me. I finally had enough fence. I told him to not talk to me anymore. My parents never called his parents. We didn't talk at all. I asked to not be scheduled with him at work, and I totally avoided him at all costs at school. We didn't have any classes together, so it wasn't too hard, but hearing the stuff he'd say about me definitely made it a little difficult. He had started rumors that I was addicted to coke and I was selling my nudes. This is when the text started. He began texting me constantly, so I blocked his number. Then he would use someone else's phone to send me messages so I blocked that person's number as well. Then he'd use WhatsApp or group me or text me since we use those for work. So I just block him on there as well. He eventually got fired from our job because he had been writing tips on receipts if people didn't ask for a copy of their receipt and left the tip line empty. The continuous messages went on for a few weeks and I just continued to block anyone he was associated with. I didn't want to be in contact with him whatsoever. He continued to make new Instagram accounts to message me on, and all of his attempts to contact me totally failed. One day I had a late lesson at School of Rock where I took guitar lessons. My teacher had stayed late for me, so I was expecting his car to be the only car in the parking lot, but it wasn't. There were two cars in the parking lot, my teacher's and then Sean's. To this day, I have no idea how he knew I was going to be there. I quickly parked, locked my doors, and thought about what to do. I then realized that he wasn't in his car, so I decided to calm down a bit and called inside to ask if he was there, but he wasn't. I cautiously got out of my car and got my guitar, then walked inside with no problems. After my lesson, I came out to see that he was now parked right next to me just waiting for me to get into my car. When he saw me, he began screaming profanities at me. I was paralyzed. He just sat there, screaming at me the whole time. I quickly climbed into my car from the passenger door so I didn't have to walk next to him and then drove home as fast as I could. He began asking people to ask me to talk to him at school. Of course I didn't. Every time someone mentioned his name to me, it caused me to have a panic attack that was so bad I'd have to leave school. I actually ended up missing the entire month of November and then switching to homeschooling. About a month after I switched to homeschool, I was driving with a friend to pick up food for my mom. As soon as we pulled into the drive through the car behind me begins to flash their brights at me. I look in my rearview mirror and I see that it's Sean's car. He has a sticker across the top of his windshield, so I knew right away it was him. I look at my friend in fear, and then she said, I didn't want to scare you, but I didn't say anything, but he's been following us since we left Target. I began to panic and just pretend to not notice him. He then pulled out of the drive through and parked right next to it by the exit. As soon as he pulled out, so did I. I sped to my friend's house, dropped her off, and went straight home. At this point, my parents thought going to the police would probably be the smartest thing to do. An officer came to my house and took a statement. I showed him screenshots of every message that he had sent me over the few months, and my friend that was in the car with me at the drive-thru also talked to him as well. We decided not to press charges, but to just file an incident report. Days go by and I don't hear anything else from Sean. I thought that maybe it was over and that now I could move on, but my dad told me that Sean had messaged him on Facebook. He had said that I was addicted to pills and that I stole money from him to buy more. I've never done pills in my life. I'm a hippie. I stick to natural stuff. 
My parents know this, so they screenshot the messages and send them to the police. The police go by his house and they tell him to stop contacting me. I continued to get messages from random Instagram accounts, and I sometimes saw his car behind me, but each time, I just wrote down the location, date, and the time that I saw him. At this point, I started to work with Alex's lawyers to prove that Sean wasn't an innocent victim. Eventually, Alex's charges were dropped. Sean was proven to be unreliable since I came forward with my story. I really wish I could say that I have an ending to this story, but I don't. I still get random messages, but I don't bother to screenshot them anymore. Since I switched to homeschool, I was able to graduate a year early, and because of that, I moved away for college, so I don't really have to worry about him following me anymore. The last that I heard about him was that he got arrested a few months ago, but I'm not really sure. It's really sad how one of my best friends that I fell in love with became one of my biggest nightmares truly sad. For some context, I'm a girl, and I was about 23 years old when this event took place. At the time, I used to work at a high-end retirement community as a concierge for the front desk. I had the 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. shift, and my duties, among others, including answering all incoming phone calls from current residents, their family members, and people interested moving into the place. On a typical night, the residents were done with dinner and other activities by about 9 p.m. Almost all of them were in their apartments by that time, turning in for the night. The night of the incident was typically quiet. I was reading a book at the desk and waiting for the 11 p.m. concierge to arrive so I could go home. It must have been around 10 p.m. when the phone started ringing. The caller ID just said unknown. This happened sometimes, so it wasn't a red flag. I answered with the standard greeting. The caller was a man and had a mature sounding voice, so I'd say he's middle aged. He said, Hi, I'm calling for my mother. I'm interested in seeing your place and getting information. I proceeded to tell him the few selling points that I was allowed to share. The levels of care we offered, the included meals, the transportation, activities, and the available nursing staff 24-7. At first, he was very pleasant, but somehow the conversation took a really weird turn. He said something along the lines of, I took my mother to get her pedicure done today. Do you like having pedicures? Quite perplexed, I responded that I did and said that we also had an in-house salon that offered pedicures and other services. He then continued, She's right here, wiggling her feet in her sandals. Here, listen. Then came a sound of something wet and squeaky. Like when you go to the beach and your feet are wet, and then you put on rubber flip-flops. I didn't really know what to respond with. The man then said, did you hear that? She's so cute. She's got her little toes painted red and her little sandals. I was quite creeped out and I just wanted the call to end. But sometimes calls are randomly recorded and I didn't want to get in trouble for hanging up on a customer. I continued on the phone and offered the phone number to the marketing department, asking him to call during business hours. Eventually, I was able to finally hang up. The 11 p.m. concierge arrived and we had a laugh about the odd conversation. I went home and returned back to work the following day. That night at around 10 p.m., again came the call from the same guy. This time he said, Hi Jane, I have more questions about your community. I asked if he had had the chance to call marketing, and he said no. That he preferred to talk to me since I was so pleasant. I still didn't want to hang up for fear of getting in trouble. He then started talking again about pedicures, and the same squeaky sound came through the phone, but in the background this time. He asked me, What color are your toes painted? I lost it. I hung up on him. Two seconds later, the phone rang again. Unknown caller. I sighed. I answered it on the off chance that it was just another unknown caller. Boy, was I naive. 
It was the pedicure guy, and he was angry. He started screaming that he would call the director in the morning and have a talk with him about my inappropriate behavior. I lied and then said, Go on ahead. You know that all the calls are recorded, right? So the director will be able to review the call himself anyways. It was silent for about two seconds, and then I heard a click. He hung up. The following night, he called again. I answered, of course, and he apologized for yelling. He said that he was still interested in bringing his mother to look at the place, and asked for the number to marketing again. I gave it to him, and that was that. The following night, I was off, but when I returned back to work a few nights later, the receptionist I was relieving gave me the messages from the unknown caller. Apparently, he had called a couple of times over the weekend at 10 p.m. and asked to speak with me only. He asked when my shifts were, and he insisted that he only wanted to talk to me directly since I was so pleasant. I was totally spooked at this point, so I decided to go to the director's office and explain what was happening. We tried to listen to the recording of the calls, but as it turns out, the machine automatically didn't record calls from unknown numbers. From that point on, for about a month, I was totally terrified that the unknown caller would just show up at my workplace. He could easily Google the address, and he already knew most of my schedule. Of course, I didn't take any calls from unknown callers anymore, with the okay from the director. Apparently, he called one night that I was off and was transferred to the director's cell phone per his request. I don't really know the details of the conversation. The director wouldn't tell me. I do know that the unknown caller stopped calling altogether after that point. So did that creepy unknown caller with a foot fetish. I really hope I don't ever get a call from you ever again. My wife and I lived in and managed an apartment complex in Colorado, and we had the nicest unit secluded from the rest. We had relatively nice tenants, but one night around 11 p.m., our dog went crazy and wouldn't stop barking at the sliding glass door. I got up to check out what was going on and there was a man standing approximately 25 yards away staring into our unit. I flickered our porch light and he didn't budge. I proceeded to grab my rifle and opened the door and sat down holding it until he walked away. I called the police but nothing ever really came of it. Three months passed by and my wife and I get home from a movie and she ran inside to go to use the bathroom. I start walking to the apartment and she's running towards me very frantically and crying, telling me there's a man standing outside of our bedroom window. I hurried towards the unit and come to find out that there's this man hunched over by our bedroom window. I told him to leave and he didn't move at all, so I continued to yell at him and he still did nothing but just stand there and stare at us. He pulled a knife out, then I pulled my pistol out and pointed it at him. By now, my wife had called the police, and as soon as he saw the police lights, he ran. The man was arrested about 20 minutes later. Apparently, he had been caught breaking into about three other houses as well. So did that creepy guy that stalked me and my wife for months. I really hope we never meet you ever again. This happened a couple of years ago when I was about 17. I had gotten home from school and wasn't feeling well, so I spent the rest of the day just laying around on the couch. By about 8pm, I was feeling even worse and decided I should just try to sleep whatever it is off. So I go to my room and get in bed and then pass out pretty quickly. I don't know how long I was asleep but I suddenly woke up in my pitch black bedroom and all I could think was, I'm going to die right now. My body was so weak, the room was spinning and my body felt like it was on fire. I look over to the edge of my bed and sitting on the edge is my grandmother who had just died a few months ago. She pats my arm and then says to me, it's gonna be okay, just call for your dad, try it call for your dad. So I start calling for him and it felt like an eternity, but he finally burst through my door and then asked me what's wrong. I look over and my grandmother's gone now. 
After that, he gets me up and he takes me to the ER, where I have a fever of 106 degrees Fahrenheit, which explains a lot. I had to get a ton of fluids and a shot in my hip, but eventually, I felt a little okay. Her being there just felt so real to me. It was weird. I know logically she wasn't, but it just felt so real. That sort of messed with my head a little. I loved her dearly, and her death was very sudden. We kept her ashes in a really nice urn in the house, under a painting that she had done herself. When I got home and passed by it, I just said thanks to her. I know it was probably just the fever melting my brain and maybe some sleep paralysis too, but still, it made me question the afterlife and all those sorts of things. For what it's worth, I really hope it was real. I've told this before, but about seven years ago, I was at my mom's house and this white car pulls into the driveway. We weren't expecting anyone, so I assumed they were lost and needed directions, and I went to the door. A woman in her 50s or 60s got out, along with a 9 or 10 year old girl. It kind of surprised me because I expected the kid to stay in the car if they just needed directions. I open the door, and the woman kind of nudges the girl towards me, both of them with big smiles plastered all over their faces. I said, hi, what can I help you with? She asked if I was Sarah, and I said yes. She told me they went to a neighbor's house looking for me, and then they pointed her to our house. They just kind of stared at me expectantly, like I was supposed to know the girl and be happy to see her. When I didn't react, the woman told me that they were there to see the dentist. Uh, no dentist here. Small ranch style house in a fairly rural neighborhood. Yeah, there's no dentist here. Not anywhere near us. The woman and the girl just kept smiling. They didn't look confused, they just kept saying, Are you sure about that? Finally they left and later on, I asked the neighbor who directed him to our house, and she said that she never told the woman my name, that the woman asked for me specifically. It's always kind of haunted me. I really feel like I was supposed to know that little girl. Like this would be someone trying to introduce me to a child that I didn't know I had. I honestly started wondering if I was nuts and had given up a child for adoption or something. It was a really strange feeling. My mom firmly believes that the girl will come back someday to tell me what it was all about. And I think about it very frequently. It drives me insane to wonder what they really wanted. My grandfather had been in World War II and told us about when himself and a few other soldiers had been separated from his unit and were trying to get to Normandy. They had gone through a clearing in a wooded area but had to drop when they heard something approaching. They were on their bellies in low grass when they saw 20 or 30 German soldiers running across the clearing very clearly in a state of panic. Then they just froze in mid-step. He said that they resembled statues and that some weren't even touching the ground and that there was no noise whatsoever. That even the birds themselves had gone silent. After a few seconds came a very loud noise, like metal scraping on concrete, and the frozen soldiers started to become blurry to the point that they just vanished without a trace. This had been reported by all of the soldiers that were present and all were called to the war office in London after their return to the UK, where they were pressed on what they saw over the period of a few days and were taken back to the same spot in France shortly after the war had ended. Surprisingly, when they got there, there were other men sharing the same accommodation who reported similar occurrences in the same exact area. They were all taken to the woods and had to describe where and how the events took place. My granddad said that the entire area was guarded very heavily and that that part of the ground was heavily excavated. The strangest things of all the other that he said was that there were hundreds of dogs in the area, just milling around for no apparent reason. They returned to the UK with a gag order, ordering them to never speak about any of this. He went back to the same spot in France before he died in 1985 
and said that the area had been covered with unmarked warehouses and was guarded by an unusually professional security company. He reckoned they were military, but he wasn't really sure. I've tried to find out more about this, but can't really find any records of it whatsoever. But I do remember one of the guys who he was with the day that it happened. He used to come and visit sometimes. He referred to the place as the Splintered Woods. Definitely pretty creepy. I used to visit my grandparents' house with my father every Sunday. There was a very odd family that lived a few houses down from them. They had a massive property in the middle of Old Pasadena. The house had three stories, a basement, and a huge backyard. I was introduced to the little girl that lived there at some birthday party. We would sit on the side of the house and go looking for four-leaf clovers. She told me she liked to play in the backyard barn, but nobody was allowed to go back there anymore. She promised me that there were a ton of animals there, and I loved animals, so I of course wanted to go. She said that we had to be very quiet and fast, but she would show it to me. We had to follow this little trail maybe a quarter of a mile behind the house. There was a ton of foliage around the trail, and it blocked out the building, and there was a big barn back there. It was pretty massive and really something you would see out of a movie. She said that it had been in the family for a really long time, but the barn looked pristine. When we approached it, she told me that we had to be very quiet and that we couldn't go inside. We started playing around the barn, but not directly next to it. We started looking for clovers again for a while, before I remembered that she mentioned animals. When I asked if we could see them, she didn't say anything, but did get up and start walking towards the barn. The grass was overgrown right up against the barn, which didn't really make any sense because it looked brand new. The rest of the area was cleared out. The grass was only overgrown up near the barn. She then started digging through the grass like she was looking for something, but she wouldn't tell me what. The longer I stood next to the barn, the more uncomfortable I got. I felt like we were somewhere that we weren't supposed to be. I became a little distracted and started looking around for our parents or some adult to just jump out and scold us. When I turned around again, there was a big pile of bones sitting on the ground. I looked up at her and she was holding a very small skull in her hands. It looked like it would have belonged to a sheep, but way smaller. She then leaned in and whispered, This is why we can't play back here. My mommy said he doesn't like animals anymore. I'm not really sure why I wasn't freaked out by that. Once I noticed the bones, I could see them scattered all throughout the grass. We heard her mom call for us and we ran back. It wasn't until a year or so later at another birthday party that I was in the backyard again. I asked her mom if we could go play by the barn and she just kind of looked at me like she'd seen an alien or something. She said they never had a barn. The trail to it just disappeared. There were big trees there and everything. Something really weird happened with the adults after that, since I wasn't allowed to go to their house anymore. I have no idea what happened. It was creepy. I asked my father a few years back if he had ever seen that neighbor's barn. He had no idea what I was talking about. Why would there be a barn in the middle of a big city? I just have no idea what happened, but every time I think about it, it still gives me the creeps. When I was 15, I was home alone hanging out upstairs in my bedroom. At the time, we had two small dogs. I was sitting in my room watching TV when the dogs started going crazy that were barking downstairs very loudly. Now, it wasn't uncommon for them to bark when a person walked by or came to the door, so I just stayed in my room and thought nothing of it at first. They kept barking, non-stop, for probably about 10 minutes before I finally got fed up and decided to go downstairs to tell them to stop it. The stairs in my house led into the kitchen, and as soon as I reached the bottom, that's when I saw him. A very tall man in a pea jacket and a top hat stood in the doorway between my kitchen and the dining room. 
I could see no face. I bolted back upstairs and locked myself in the bathroom, where I then called my parents. In the time that I was waiting for them to come home, I began hearing several seemingly aggravated male voices outside of the bathroom door. I was absolutely terrified. Eventually, my aunt arrived at my house to check on me, and the voices had faded, and so I was able to calm down. About two years ago, I got a phone call from my mother, telling me that she had been reading the local newspaper and that there was an article in it about my childhood home, and that it was written by the town historian. The house was built in 1805 and had once been a local gathering spot for the elite of the small village. The first floor had once been a parlor and a tavern of sorts, while the second floor of the house functioned as a dance hall. Things in this house had been rearranged a bit. The staircase, being one of those things, had been moved from what was now a second floor bedroom closet, which would exit downstairs between the kitchen and dining room. My family was slightly aware of this, but never had the exact details of it. Very cool, I thought. That is, until my mom continued reading. In 1836, there was an accident. Three men got into an argument about their differing political views, two of them against the other. The disagreement ended with the third man being pushed over the railing at the top of the stairs, landing at the base of the stairs, where he slowly suffered from and eventually succumbed to his injuries. The spot where he died was the same exact spot that I had seen the faceless man in the top hat almost 15 years ago. My mom clipped the news article and my father framed it and hung it in the dining room, right near the doorway into the kitchen. An hour later, while my father was home alone, he heard a crash. Upon investigation, he had found the clipped article in its shattered frame, laying face down, 15 feet from where he had hung it. I always knew that what I had seen and heard was supernatural. Now you'll never convince me otherwise. You'll also never convince me to stay in that house alone ever again. Yeah, definitely not happening. By my hometown, there was a hiking trail that people went to very infrequently. It was along the side of the Niagara Escarpment, so it had some climbable cliffs and some very shallow caves that you could crawl around on. I went with some friends when I was around 19 to 20 years old, and we were crawling around and found a cave that was pretty deep. We had never been in there before and had never seen it before. So we pushed forward and decided to check it out, even though we had no flashlights, and this was when cell phones didn't really have a flashlight function. We stepped into the cave and it was easily 20 to 30 degrees cooler than outside. Upon looking around in which light we had, we noticed that it was really clean inside the cave, as in it didn't have beer cans littered all over the place like all of the other small caves did. While inside the cave, we all began to get a really eerie feeling, hearing weird and strange things, feeling like we were being touched, poked, and pulled, and not having any way to figure out who was doing it because it was too dark. We were just using lighters to see what was around us, we were convinced one of us was messing with the others, although any time we sparked up a lighter, we were all decently far apart. We decided to hightail it out of there after only a few minutes, convinced to come back once we had flashlights. We came out to see that it was now dusk outside. When we entered, it was midday. Somehow we had lost roughly three hours while inside of this cave. We went back with flashlights in the next week, but have never been able to find this cave again. I really don't know what to think about it. It really creeps me out. I have a lot of really weird experiences in my life that made me question reality, but this is my most recent weird one. My mother died about a year and a half ago. My stepdad couldn't handle it, so he packed up and left their house. He let the mortgage company take it back and it sat empty since she passed. The house is on a hill and they have a huge barn in a field below the house an acre away. About a few weeks ago, my sister who lives down the road from the house called me and told me that the lights were on in my mom's bedroom and all of the barn lights were on as well. 
Hours pass and her husband decided to go up the hill to the house. He walks in the door and walked to the light switch to shut off the lights to the barn. He switched the barn lights off and literally all of the lights went off. The inside and the outside lights just shut off at the same time. He freaked out a little bit and switched it back on, but there was nothing. No lights, no power, no anything. He then turns around and then leaves as fast as he could. The power had been off for over a year at that point. We assume the mortgage company had turned on the power at first, but they haven't. The service is still off. There were probably about 12 lights running on that phantom power. I'd like to add some extra information and some additional weirdness. My mother died in her room. My sister keeps having dreams of her asking for food or water. I can't really figure out what caused the lights to be on. My grandfathers on both sides were master electricians, and my father and my mother and stepfather were also electricians. I was also an electrician for many years, so I don't really have a good explanation for this. My best guess is water got into the outside meter box and caused a connection across the plastic covered meter blades, then made a temporary short, but once he flicked off the barn light switch, it broke the connection and couldn't continue powering the inside light that was on and then couldn't reconnect after he flicked the switch back on. It hadn't rained in a week when that happened, so it doesn't really make any sense, and it's all I can think of to explain it as not some supernatural weirdness. If any of you have a better explanation, I would really love something rational so I can understand it. My irrational side says to go to the barn and investigate. My mother is sending a message. My last bit of oddity is about a guitar string. About a week after she passed away, I woke up and went into the bathroom to pee. I stepped out of bed and a guitar string wrapped around my foot. The guitar string was a flat wound E string. That E string came from a set that was inside a guitar case from another room. It was a very specific type of string and it's unmistakable. I haven't opened that case in years and it wasn't in my bedroom. My mother bought me that guitar when I was a teen. I really have no idea what to think of any of this. If you have any answers, please let me know. I'm a TA in our college's anatomy class, which takes place in the cadaver lab. Dead Corpses Late one night, I'm working alone in the cadaver lab, and I start to hear a noise. It's hard to tell what the noise sounds like, but it's like a consistent muffled noise. So, I kind of walk around the room and locate it. Now normally, the bodies are all kept in these big metal crates. But at that time, we had one more body than we did crates. So one body was in a plastic body bag, and that's where the noise was coming from. So I'm terrified at this point, all alone in the lab, looking down at this plastic body bag that I can see the outline of the body that presumably is coming back to life because it is definitely making noise. I stood over this body for a solid minute, debating whether I should open the bag. And finally the noise just stops. I got all of my things together and bolted from the lab. I don't really know what to think, but that was one of the creepiest nights of my life. There was an old man who lived on the same road that I drove every day to get to the highway. He always sat on his front porch drinking his morning coffee, and he always waved at me when I drove by, and I always waved back. This went on for the better part of a decade. One day I was talking to my neighbor about how much Mr. So-and-so waving to me made my morning so awesome, and I was really glad that he was still kicking around. My neighbor then says to me, Wait, what? Um, he's been dead for about three years now. After that, I never saw him again. So, I guess my question is, who the heck was I waving at? I woke up in the middle of the night having to pee really bad, and from my position on the top bunk, I could see into the hallway. The bathroom was right across the hall from my bedroom door, and also right in my vision. I was just starting to move to climb down and go to the bathroom 
when I then saw, heard, and felt the footsteps of a man coming down the hall and going into the bathroom. I thought that it must be my dad, but that was kind of strange because he and my mom had their own bathroom. Even stranger, he didn't turn on the light or close the door. So after a while, I got annoyed because I really had to go, and I called out to him. No answer. So I finally climbed down and switch on the lights, and I just find an empty bathroom. I had definitely seen a figure, heard the footsteps, and felt the vibrations of the footsteps of a large man come down the hall and go in there. I was only about 10 years old when this happened, but I still remember it so vividly because it's the freakiest thing that's ever happened to me. I've never really believed in the paranormal, but I don't know. Going through something like that really makes you wonder. When I was just old enough to not need a babysitter after school, I was home alone on one summer day. My parents, who would not be back until later, made me promise to lock the door and not answer the door to any strangers. I did this religiously, as I was also anxious about being in the house alone. There was a hefty bolt on our front door, and I was to make sure that I used it. I would see my folks come home and know how to unlock it. So I'm in the house playing with my Legos upstairs. I then hear the unmistakable sound of the front door open and close. I even felt the percussive thud that was so familiar as the door closed. Thinking one of my parents must have come home early, I then went down there to greet them. No one there. I then saw the bolt was still across. Now my blood runs cold as I start racing through the possibilities to explain this. I check all of the doors and windows in a panic. All locked. It was a standard four bedroom family house, not a mansion. Easily checked. Now I'm all alone in the house, so how the heck is the bolt across? It's absolutely impossible to open that door from the outside. Key or no key. I'm sure it was the door I heard. The house was silent and it was a very loud and distinctive noise. It did not compute. I noped out of there really fast and went to a friend's house. He didn't really believe me and he was certain I was winding him up. But I promise. I was absolutely terrified and to this day, I still have no idea how to explain it. This happened last year, and it still gives me the creeps thinking about it. I was leaving work and I was on my way to a friend's house. Now, my work is on the literal edge of town. It's pretty rural and it gets really dead at night. My friends leave even further from my work, and where I guess you consider to be the country area, and the road gets more and more desolate the closer you get to their house. I clocked out of work, went to my car, and called my friend to talk to her on the phone about something while I drove to her and her boyfriend's house. I looked both ways before exiting the parking lot, but there was absolutely nobody else on the road that I could see, which was a pretty good distance. I made it about a mile or so down the road when I then see headlights right behind me and coming up fast. It was a full-size pickup truck that had been lifted, and he got so close to my car that all I could see out my back window was the Chevy badge on his grill. I thought he wanted to pass me, so I waved out the window for him to pass using the suicide lane, since the road was only two lanes there. Instead, he then started laying on his horn. Mind you, I'm not a slowpoke driver. I was already doing about 55 in a 45 so it's not like I was inconveniencing him with my speed. I tell my friend what's happening, and she tells me to just keep going and that he'll probably leave me alone eventually. He stays glued behind me for about another mile or so, occasionally honking some more. Eventually, he started turning his brights on for a few seconds, and then he started slowing down until we were a couple hundred feet apart. Then he'd floor it to fly up behind me really fast, like he was feigning rear-ending me. I'm getting more sketched out at this point and my friend is trying to calm me down and just telling me to just keep driving. At this point I'm really scared that he's going to hit me and I just wanted to get away, but there was no businesses open that late this far out of the city. 
In fact, there wasn't really any places to be open anymore, just some fields and houses every now and then. I decided to floor it and try to outrun him, figuring my Corolla might not be a Formula One car, but surely it's a hell of a lot quicker than an old pickup truck and I could get some distance. I got up to about 85 vents, I just kept an eye on him, and he didn't seem to be trying to catch up anymore. I felt a little safer and assumed he'd given up, so I dropped back down to about 60 and then informed my friend that it worked and I think he was done. I still had tunnel vision from the adrenaline, hence I didn't really realize that he was flying up right behind me again until he was barreling towards me doing about 85 or even 90. I realized he wasn't slowing down, so I braced myself for the impact and then told my friend that he was about to rear-end me. Instead, however, he cut around me, missing my car by inches and then flew around right in front of me. The next part was my fault. I instinctively turned on my blinker, which let him know that I was about to turn onto the road, so he immediately whipped up the curb to cut in front of me yet again. My friend's house is on the corner, so her and her boyfriend were able to see everything now, but I had a bit of ways to go before I got to her driveway. The truck stayed put in the middle of the road this time, and he wasn't moving, so I tried to go around him. As soon as I started to pass him, he then floored it and cut to the left, nearly hitting my front end and blocking the road completely. I was feeling a little bit braver now that I knew that help was on the way and that my friends were there. So I laid on my horn, yelled some choice words, and then told him to move his butt. My friend and her boyfriend had gotten to the edge of the property where we were by then, and I guess the driver took notice of them and slowly started moving out of my way. I pulled into her driveway as fast as I could and looked at the rearview mirror to see him slowly driving up to her driveway, where he then stopped. I couldn't really see his facial features because it was so dark and he was kind of far away but I could tell that he was staring at me the whole time. My friends had gotten to my car just as he got to the driveway, and I then watched my friend approach the truck. I then heard her say, You need to leave now. The cops are on their way. I remember seeing them just stare at each other for a few seconds before he slowly continued on. Now, her neighborhood is on a giant loop, and he never exited, so we felt really adventurous and sneaked around the block in search of where he went while we waited on the cops. We found the truck parked at a house and then returned just as the police arrived. We told the cops where the truck was, and the officer then returned, informing us that there was no answer at the door, and then he left. Her boyfriend, who had lived there forever, nor his mother recognized the truck or the man. And if I recall correctly, his mother even knew the people who lived at the house the truck was parked at. As far as I'm aware, the man wasn't seen ever again. Because I'm a very small female who was alone at almost midnight, we all assume he watched me leave work and was trying to bully me into wrecking my car so that I would then pull over and he could try to kidnap me. We think that once he realized the cops were involved, he then parked the truck in someone's otherwise empty driveway and then likely left it there to hide in a nearby field until the cops left the area. Who really knows though? This happened to me over 10 years ago, and it was the creepiest encounter I ever had. I was at a concert of my coworker at the time. It wasn't really good and at a church in a small town about 40 minutes away by car from the town that I lived. When it was over, I found that I had missed my last bus. I asked my coworker if I could sleep at his place, but he rejected. So I did what I always do in such a situation. I walked. It was the time before smartphones, so the only way for me to find the right path was by reading the street signs and just really hope for the best. I gotta admit, I actually cried the entire time while walking. It was about 2 in the morning when I then arrived at the next train station. I thought that I could take a ride with a cab, but there were no cabs. I didn't really know what to do, so I waited at the place where the cab should be and then smoked a cigarette. Should I walk the way home? I mean, it was another hour by foot or possibly even more. Should I wait until a cab shows up or maybe the first train in the morning? I really didn't know what to do. Then out of nowhere, 
a car shows up and stopped right in front of me. The man inside rolled down the passenger window and then spoke to me. Hey there, can you give me a light please? He said. I wasn't really comfortable at all going over to him, but I did. I gave him a light and quickly turned around and then stood at the same place as before. He didn't drive away. He then asked me where I had to go. I said in which town that I lived and he then invited me to get into the car. He said it's on his way and that he could bring me home. I really don't know why, but I decided to get in the car. I really didn't want to, but I was just so exhausted. The ride itself wasn't that bad at all. We had a little small talk and he drove the usual route that I knew. He wasn't really creepy while driving, and I thought that maybe he really was just a nice guy helping me out. I guided him to my house. However, he didn't really stop in front of it. Instead, he drove a bit further away. I then thanked him and gave him my lighter as a gift. Right when I was about to open the door and then leave the car, he then said to me, What the heck's wrong with you? I was really surprised by his sudden mood change. Uh, what? I asked, caught off guard. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was something along the lines of, That's not how you thank someone who just drove you home in the middle of the night. I expect you to do a favor for me in return. Something like that. I kind of understood what he implied, but, well, I'm not a hooker. I chuckled a little bit and thanked him again, gave him the lighter, and got out of the car. I walked towards my home when I then heard him opening and closing the door. The next thing I heard was the sound of him running towards me. I looked over my shoulder and I saw him getting closer to me. I then shrieked like a mouse and I started running as well. At the door of my home, I quickly opened it, got inside, locked it, ran upstairs to my bedroom, locked my door as well, and then hid under my blanket. I got away and nothing else happened. He didn't do anything else. He left and I never saw him ever again. I know it's a happy ending, but still, hopefully I never run into that guy or anyone like that ever again. I'm originally from Portland, Oregon. I got a really great opportunity to take a scholarship at a school in Washington, D.C. My family doesn't come for money, and to ship my car and fly out with all my stuff would have cost several thousand dollars. Plus, I was so afraid that the airline would break my cello, so that wasn't the move. I decided to pack my car full of all my crap and hit the road. I mapped it out that it would take four days if I hustled, and it cost me around $500 total with gas, eating off the dollar menu, and sleeping in my car. Good stuff. Fast forward one whole day and I'm like, screw every single bit of this. I was at a pace of about 16 hours of driving, just starting my second day. There was nowhere good to sleep in my car out in the middle of nowhere that runs around I-90. The only marginally okay place I found was the parking lot of a small hospital somewhere in Montana, and it just felt so sketchy to be sleeping in my car. Like, I can't put my finger on what exactly made me feel some type of way, but the further I got from Oregon, I just felt like I drew the attention of people. I was literally just running off of adrenaline, covering 800 miles a day, calling my parents at every rest stop and leaving voicemails on the machine to let them know where I was. It was physically and emotionally exhausting. I was just so ready to be at my actual dorm and sleep in a real bed again. My car wasn't super old, but it was a flood salvage and not the most reliable thing. It had random engine lights that were permanently on, and I was just so afraid it was going to break down and leave me stranded out in the middle of nowhere. If you've never made this kind of trip, at least at this point in time, you needed to pack cans of gas in your trunk because you would run out of gas with a full tank before you even hit a gas station in some places. I remember driving all day through nothing but literal tumbleweeds, sleeping on the side of the road, waking up, and not seeing civilization again for a total of about 12 hours worth of driving. Fast forward to Wyoming. Now, I don't exactly remember where, but I was near the South Dakota and Nebraska border. 
I was running low on cash due to a rock hitting my side mirror and breaking the glass, and I really needed to buckle down in order to have enough for gas. I saw a sign at some tiny church that said, Free Community Spaghetti Dinner. It was listed as that evening and I was totally down for it. It was a few hours until it started, but I figured I could stop by and introduce myself and help set up and then enjoy that sweet spaghetti. And maybe they would let me take a plate to go too. God knows I could use it. Long story short, it was great. I met some really nice folks and ate some really good spaghetti. Everyone seemed so amazed at my journey. The pastor even ended up asking me if I wanted to sleep there for the night. A lady then chimes in that they would absolutely find a place for me to stay. And there was a third person who also chimed in, saying that he had some cots down in the preschool of the basement and that I could use one of those. Heck yeah. I was totally down. So the time rolls around, we finish cleaning up, and everyone leaves the church. I get shown to my cot. Besides the inherent creepiness of sleeping on a cot in a dark preschool, there were really no red flags at all. That cot was absolute magic compared to the van. I put a few of them together, made a nest out of pillows, and I was able to stretch out mostly comfortably. I remember waking up at some point in the night to hearing footsteps. It seemed like they were just kind of wandering around though. I sat frozen, just holding my breath like, holy crap. And then it hit me. I forgot to call my dad and tell him where I was. I was sleeping on a cot in a basement of a church that I actually just realized I didn't even know the name of. Didn't even know what town I was in. Nobody knew where I was and now there's a stranger wandering around in this dark church. I quickly decided to try and get the heck out of there. I quietly put on my shoes and then tried to tiptoe opposite where I thought I heard someone. I felt such anxiety heading into the dark stairwell. I knew that there was probably an emergency exit at the end of the hall in the stairwell, and I then decided that I would just start running. All of a sudden, someone started shouting and then grabbing the back of my shirt. I could feel their cold hand on the exposed skin on my back, and then they ripped the spaghetti strap. I then slid out of the open button down without them being able to grab me again, and I kept running. It was way too dark to see them or where they came from. I didn't turn around and I didn't look back. I just kept running up the hill in the dark. I lost one of my shoes as I cut my foot on something in the grass, but I didn't even care. I kept running with only one shoe until I got to my car and then burnt rubber through the empty parking lot. The only car to even be seen was a sedan in the passenger's driveway. I actually drove the entire way until the gas light came on. I didn't even stop to refill the tank until the light was out. So, whoever grabbed me in the middle of the night in a dark church for God knows why, I really hope I don't run into you ever again. I don't have a car, so Uber or Lyft is my main mode of transportation to get to work. This morning, I requested an Uber about a half an hour before I had to be there, and the pickup was supposed to take less than five minutes. But for some reason, my Uber driver kept going in circles. He ended up calling me asking for directions, and I was telling him exactly where he needed to be, and so was the GPS in the background. At that point, I was irritated and asked if there was a way he could cancel because I was going to be late. He said that he couldn't, and he ended up finding his way to my apartment at the same time I was supposed to be at work. He kept apologizing and I would just mumble, it's fine, I just really need to get there. He ended up taking me to another store that was on the way and then asked, this is it right? It literally took all of me not to blow up. I calmly gave him the directions to the actual store I work at and just told him to please listen to the GPS. We finally get to my job and I'm nearly 20 minutes late and as soon as he parked, I muttered thanks, got out, and bolted to the office to clock in. About an hour or so into my shift, one of my managers came up to tell me that my Uber driver has been harassing the people in front of the store 
and trying to get a hold of me and my manager to take fault for me being late and also apologize to me. You need a membership to shop there, so he kept getting kicked out. He actually tried on four to five separate times to come in. Another hour goes by and a different manager approached me to let me know that the Uber driver had resorted to blowing up the store's phone begging to speak to me. She had asked me not to leave alone and definitely be on the lookout in case he came back. I contacted Uber support multiple times to let them know that this happened. And do you want to know what they did about it? They gave me a $3 credit. I made sure to give him a one star so I wouldn't get him as a driver ever again. But it's just really scary to think that he knows where I work and live now. After this, I'm pretty creeped out to continue using Uber. About four years ago, I was a line cook at a restaurant that was located in a hotel. I worked at this restaurant for nearly two years, with no problem walking the half mile or so distance that it took for me to reach the bus to get home for my job. This restaurant had a partnership with the hotel for late night room service. So, pretty much every night after closing the restaurant, one, sometimes two line cooks would stay until after 3 a.m. preparing simple things like salads, sandwiches, and wraps that would then be taken to the rooms via hotel employees. Now, me being a recent college grad in my early 20s would always volunteer myself for the extra hours. As I said prior, I had worked this job for a decent amount of time with no problems. That is, except for one rainy night I'll never forget. As I left my work that morning, around 3 a.m., I realized that I messed up when I forgot an umbrella that day. I now had to make my normal walk under decent rainfall. After lighting a cigarette and putting in my headphones, I was ready to make my unfortunate journey. I started on my normal routine walking back cutting through the alleyways that I had memorized as my shortcuts through the city. About halfway through my walk, a car started following next to me with the passenger window down. Aware of my surroundings, I had recognized this, but decided to mind my business and keep my head down and keep walking. Growing up in a rough neighborhood taught me better than to put my nose where it doesn't belong. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough. Over the music coming from my headphones, I could hear shouting coming from the car. I turned to face the driver, but didn't stop walking. He looked back at me. A white man in his late 30s, early 40s, with a bandana and sunglasses on. I remember thinking that it's pretty odd he was driving with sunglasses so late in the night. Hey man, where are you heading? I could hear him say, at this point, I took out one earbud and then replied, Uh, what's it to you? To which he answered, I figured I'd ask. You look like you need a ride to get out of the rain. I told the guy I'm all set and that I was almost at my destination. Now, keep in mind, I'm still walking and he's driving very slowly next to me on this side street at 3 a.m. No problem, he replied. Do you smoke, man? He asked. At this point, I was getting pretty annoyed with the guy. I had just gotten done working 13 hours in the kitchen, and all I wanted to do was listen to some music and unwind before bed. Nah, man, I don't. Even though I do, I replied in a stern and obviously annoyed tone. He just looked at me, almost like he knew that I was full of crap. I then said to him, Have a good night before replacing my earphone back into my ear and taking a right up a one-way side street, losing him in the process. I arrived at my bus stop safely and with about 10 minutes to spare. I was the only one there besides one other man and a homeless man sleeping on a bench some ways up. After about three minutes, that car pulls up to the side of the curb, directly in the bus lane. This time, however, I'm now facing him. He rolled down the window. You're heading to the south side, huh? He said. I replied. How do you know? He pointed above me. I looked up. 
On the digital board, it says the next bus destination and time. You want a lift there? I'm actually heading that way, he said. At this point, I was all set, and the hood just came right out of me. Hey man, I don't know you, and I don't want to ride with you, so screw off, I said angrily. He just stared at me again, but this time I stared back. We then locked eyes for a good 20 seconds before the bus approached behind him honking loudly. The guy checked his rearview mirror, rolled up the window, and then sped off. On the way home, I remember looking behind me and my surroundings just to make sure that this creep didn't try to follow me home. Luckily he didn't and when I got off the bus, I got into my apartment safely and sound within about five minutes. Fast forward about a week. One of my buddies who I work with asked me if I had heard about the body that the cops found in a dumpster behind the grocery store, less than five minutes from the hotel. I replied no. He then told me that the body of a girl was found strangled to death and cops were on the lookout for the suspect. The cops had no evidence and were asking for people to come forward with additional information. Now, I hadn't told my buddy or anyone else besides my girlfriend at the time what happened that night. When I told him my story, he insisted that I call the cops and tell them what happened. I told him I would, but I never did. Call me old school, but like I said earlier, I learned growing up to mind my business and to avoid trouble and trouble won't find me. So that's what I did. Till this day, I haven't heard anything more on the case. I wonder if it was the same guy. I think about how weird it was for him to approach me the way he did at such an odd hour of the day. The sunglasses, the following me to the bus stop, that stuff doesn't normally happen, right? After that experience, I started walking home with my paring knife in my pocket and walked with only one earphone in the whole time so that I could hear my surroundings better. I also stopped volunteering for the overnight shift. I really hope whoever did that to that girl gets caught or at least has a change of heart. It's pretty crazy just how fragile life really is. Be careful out there. My grandma is a really big road rager, and she likes to cuss, flip off, and pull around people all the time. It's gotten better in her later years, but this was in 2014, I believe. My grandma didn't tell my grandpa and I this story until it happened. Before we get into that, here's some background and how I knew the mom and kids. The mom was so sweet. I was in her son's class in elementary, and I walked past her all the time on the way to buses while she was waiting for my classmate. I also had daycare with all three of the kids. I can't say that I met her boyfriend or ever saw him since I was so young and was in my own world playing with friends, but once while walking past her, she asked if I knew where my classmate was, since he was running late, and I just stood next to her and played with her youngest while she waited until I almost missed the bus. So back to the incident. My grandma is a really big road rager on her way back from work, mostly because of rush hour. She was going around a roundabout, and there was a car behind her that kept honking and riding on her bumper. She finally got sick of it because she was focused on trying to get around this new roundabout and honked her horn for a few seconds while at a stop and flipped the car off. She watches this guy in the mirror as he gets out of the car and then cracks his knuckles while speed walking up to her car. He's cussing her out and she recognized the look on his face from past incidents with not too nice men that she had known before. She was on her own though. Her car required her to manually lock the doors and trunk and roll up the window. She basically said screw it and sped around the stopped cars that were in front of her and got off the roundabout. About a month later, they're watching the news while I'm in my room and my grandparents start talking. My grandpa yells for me, so I get up and go back to the room. Don't you know this kid? My grandpa asked and I nodded, feeling confused and wondering if something happened to him. My grandpa plays the news story. Do you know this mom? The news told the whole story of how the man strangled her to death 
and also posted pictures with the caption that read, If you don't believe me, watch the Washington News Channel at about 5. Her son will be home then. It was the oldest son that discovered her nude and dead. I had a few interactions with him before because of daycare, and my entire heart just hurts now just thinking about it. My grandma sat up when they showed the boyfriend's face, and then we realized it. It was the same man that was in the car behind her. Even I recognized him. That was when my grandma told us the whole story, and just thinking about it sends shivers down my entire body. He could have been slowly breaking just then, and that's why I raged out like he did. I'm just so happy my grandma got out of the roundabout when she did. I'm not saying that he would have hurt my grandma, but he was already an abuser to women. So who's to say he wouldn't have at least hurt her as well? I talked to all three boys at one point or another that year when I found their Instagrams. I don't think I talked to the oldest, but I tried to get in contact with no luck. My classmate didn't really want to talk about it, but I tried my best to console him out of doing stuff. The youngest ran a whole account for his mom and would post just about the same picture every time he was missing her. I think he even wrote a book about it. I have no idea where they are five years later, but I don't think they're in PO anymore. The mom was sweet and her boys were very good kids. None of them deserve this. I hope the guy that did this gets what's coming to him. This happened about eight years ago. This is about my friend. I've known her since I was 15 years old. We'll call her A. We were co-workers for about five years, and when I turned 18, we became roommates. Her boyfriend at the time also lived with us. So A was always kind of different. She was very religious and always talked about God. And she struggled with partying or smoking without feeling guilty about it afterwards. We would throw house parties. Nothing too crazy. Just a group of us playing beer pong, drinking, and maybe a little bit of smoking. Nothing ever crazy happened, but literally after every time, she would have to tell me she can't do this anymore. That she needs to focus on her relationship with God. Yet, the parties were usually her idea. But I got so used to her being like that that I just thought that's her personality. Okay, so after about a year of us all living together, her boyfriend decided to break up with her. They were together since high school, and he's about three years older than her. So when this happens, I feel like this is where the chaos started. She starts to see therapists and a psychologist because she went into a severe depression. I'm not really sure what doctor decided to put her on Adderall, but she tells me that she's been diagnosed with depression and ADD. I really didn't think much of it because I've known a few people that take the same medication and it seemed to help them. After a few months of her being on this medication, she drops a lot of weight and becomes way more spontaneous and did things that were pretty out of character for her. For one, she became very promiscuous. She would drive to San Diego, which is almost three hours away from where we live, to have one night stands. It wasn't until another few months after that that I started to notice something was really off. She started sleeping with one of our coworkers and got oddly jealous if anyone would just talk to him. We all worked in the same department, so we all kind of had to talk to each other. I asked him if he could grab something from the back, and I turn around and she's just staring at me with this angry blank stare and says, I know what you're doing. Um, what? I said, because I literally had no idea what she was talking about. I see the way you're looking at him. I know what you're trying to do. Um, are you being serious right now? Please tell me you're joking. I see it. You can't lie to me. I know what you're trying to do, and I won't let it happen. So, by this time I was so pissed off that I left work and went straight home, because she was 100% serious. It didn't freak me out as much as it pissed me off. I've known this person for years. We live and work together. How could she think that of me? 
let alone treat me that way. So after that, things got so bad with her. She was always accusing me of all kinds of bull crap. One minute she'd talk to me all friendly, then the next accused of me being in her room going through her stuff. Eventually, I had to move out and she went back to living with her grandma. We still worked together, but I asked to work different shifts if possible. Then, I didn't see her for almost six months. She just didn't come back to work. No one would tell me why or anything that happened. It was almost a year when I got a Facebook message from her asking me if she could see me and talk. So much time had passed that I wasn't really angry. I was just worried. I wanted her to be okay. So by this time, I now live with my husband. So I tell her she can come by my apartment. When she showed up, I could hardly recognize her. She had put on a lot of weight and it looked like she let her hygiene completely go. Not to the point that she looked homeless or anything, just very noticeable, especially from how she used to look. So I just kind of knew she had gone through something. She didn't want to come in, so we just went for a walk and she begins to tell me what happened. She said that she had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Apparently it was drug induced by the Adderall. I guess it all started when she went on a hike with her family. She said that her dad turned into a demon and he was going to hurt her. She tried to run away but her family had to restrain her and call the cops. They had her held for a 72 hours. She said it was like God gave her the ability to see who was a good person or bad by just seeing them as demons or as people. She told me she takes medication for it now and she's going to this Bible study group that has really helped her. I told her that's great and that I'm always here and I can't imagine what she's gone through. So we start to hang out a few times after that. I go to her apartment once or twice a week just to hang out and talk. It was like assisted living but for people with mental disorders. I never thought of her as dangerous because, well, she was on her meds and from what I've read and heard, schizophrenics aren't usually violent. Plus, she seems somewhat well. After about a month of hanging out though, she keeps trying to get me to go to this Bible study group. I tell her that I'm not really interested in that, but she eventually becomes ridiculously persistent. Randomly stopping by my apartment trying to get me to go. So this is where I slowly stopped coming by because it was like every minute we hung out she always brought it up and just wouldn't let it go. About a week goes by. I didn't really talk to her or answer her calls, and if I did, I just came up with an excuse as to why I couldn't come by. A part of me felt bad, but it was like something was telling me to just distance myself for a bit. The following Friday, my mom calls me and she asks if I read the newspaper. She tells me that A is in the newspaper. The very night before, A's mom stopped by her apartment. I guess that she was very upset and disoriented. Her mom tried to calm her down, but she couldn't, so she tried to call the police because she was getting more aggravated and aggressive. A ends up chasing and stabbing her mom seven times. Come to find out later from her family, she had stopped taking her medication because God told her she didn't need them. She thought that her mom was trying to hurt her and that she was a demon. Believe it or not, her mom actually survived this and was able to make it to the neighbors. I guess the police found A wandering around her apartment complex with the knife still in her hand. They said that she wouldn't talk to anyone. She just had this look on her face like she wasn't even there. When the police took her away, she didn't struggle or say anything. To think if I didn't distance myself, that easily could have been me. The thought of her being so violent never ever entered my mind. It's just a really scary and honestly heartbreaking story. It's almost as if I had to grieve for her because who she used to be no longer existed. She just really didn't deserve that kind of life. This happened a few years ago in a city in Ontario. It was the middle of winter and my best friend and I were leaving a house party at 3 a.m. Now, I like to smoke the green, but for some reason, I had this feeling at this party that I needed to stay sober that night. 
which I never feel the need to do. The house the party was at was on the main street in this city. I'm not kidding. It was literally called Main Street. We leave the party and are walking up the main street, on the left side of the street towards a parking lot where I left my car. As we pass a side street, a guy in his early 20s approaches us asking us for directions to the clubbing street in my hometown. We directed him into the clubbing area, but he kind of lingered as if he expected us to walk with him. We just stayed and waited until he started walking in the direction of the parking lot before we began walking behind him because we didn't want to walk with him. My friend who was really buzzed at the time just kind of stared and then asked me, why does he keep looking back at us? And who's he talking to on the phone? I thought she was just being paranoid and I told her not to worry about it. He was probably just looking at us because he wanted us to come to the club with him. This is when things got crazy. All of a sudden, a man in his 40s began jogging in the middle of the empty main street parallel to us, at the same pace we were walking, holding a German Shepherd tightly to his side. He kept looking at us and nudging his German Shepherd, as if to make it more agitated or riled up. At this point, we start to realize something is very wrong, and begin speed walking towards the parking lot. As we approach the parking lot, I look behind us to see if there's any way we can book it back to the party, and as I look back, I see the two men come out from behind a store that sits at the beginning of the parking lot. I then make eye contact with one of the men who comes out from behind the building, and he looks me dead in the eye and then smiles. And I'm gonna chop you up into tiny little pieces kind of smile. At this point, we're freaking the heck out now. One man in front of us, one man with a dog to our right, two men behind us, and to our left is the parking lot where I left my car. As we turn into the parking lot, the younger guy in front of us stops walking and then turns back around and doubles back into the parking lot. They all begin yelling to each other as a dark blue van in the lot turns on and rolls down the windows yelling back to them. As they all begin to circle us, we finally made it to my car. Now, this will forever be the reason I believe I have a guardian angel. I had actually parked my car three parking spots before the van that turned on. As they realized that we were getting into a car, not cutting through the parking lot, it became clear they had all not anticipated this. As I was fumbling trying to find my keys, they all kind of froze for a second trying to figure out what to do. As I unlocked the car and we got in, they then circled the car and one of the guys hit the front window, actually yelling, Where do you ladies think you're going? I have never freaking pulled out of a lot so fast in my life. I momentarily debated if I should try to run one of them over. We drove away and I called 911 immediately after. Long story short, they ended up having us come in for a police interview. As one week prior, a woman had been inducted by a van with the same description before being brutally assaulted at some random house for an entire night, then being dumped on some side street by these messed up men. What freaked us out the most about the entire situation was how planned and calculated they had been. They had found a young guy to pretend to ask for directions. We figured out after the fact that he probably wanted us to walk with him so he could suggest cutting through the parking lot, then have grabbed us when we passed the van. Bottom line is, stay safe. After this incident, I don't like to walk around at night at all if I'm not with at least three other people, and preferably a man. It's so scary to me to think that even if we had figured out what was happening and knew basic self-defense, we still wouldn't be safe because really... What can two girls do against five men and a German Shepherd? Seriously, everyone, be careful out there, and always, always watch your surroundings.